Look, I'm stunned how smart this guy is. Welcome to Real Physics and another discussion about fundamental physics. Let's go in. My prompt, I would like to discuss fundamental physics with you. The goal is not to propose a theory of everything, but to address questions that need to be answered by such TOA candidates. In my view, most contemporary attempts are misguided because they do not even ask these questions and miss the big picture. Therefore, I argue that we should focus on the settled science before 1930. In general, I do not want you to be agreeable and I encourage you to challenge what I am saying. You should take a mainstream stance, but try to focus on mathematical logical reasoning rather than parroting modern views. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Let's proceed. How could a possible theory of everything ever be accepted? David Lindley, in his book, I love the irony, The End of Physics, writes, there is no way to know in advance what this theory of everything will look like. But most physicists like to think when they see it, they will recognize it. What is your take on that? Acceptance would hinge on a combination of internal consistency, unification of existing theories, and testable predictions that match experimental results. In practice, Lindley's irony highlights our current inability to anticipate the exact form such a theory might take. Yet. Once a framework emerges elegantly explains all known phenomena and reliably predicts new results, physicists would likely know it when they see it. Well, I have my doubts. Thus, let us find some common ground. I will propose you a series of five increasingly controversial statements you may agree or disagree with. I will argue that all statements are correct, but if at some point you don't want to follow any longer, that's okay. At least we will know better what we are talking about when discussing that theory of everything, right? Absolutely. I'd be interested to hear those statements. Let's start with the first one. The first one is, physics has achieved something useful for our civilization based on fundamental insights. Thus, to evaluate possible future insights, we should analyze the achievements of the past. Yes, I agree. Looking back at past breakthroughs, understanding their context, logical foundations and impact, helps us identify common threads that might guide future fundamental insights. We use cell phones because 150 years ago someone was curious about electromagnetic waves. We take pictures because in 1905 Einstein understood how light releases electrons from metals. And his theory of relativity is the reason why you know where you are when using your GPS. Let's go a little bit deeper here and consider the sensational discovery of electromagnetic waves by Heinrich Hertz in 1886. It boils down to a very simple formula. Epsilon naught mu naught r 1 over c squared. The electric and magnetic constants are related to the speed of light c. That means light is an electromagnetic wave. From a methodological perspective, however, this equation reduces the number of constants from 3 to 2 one constant less. Thus, I would argue, my second statement, that in the past progress was related to reducing the number of fundamental constants. The less unexplained numbers, the closer we are to that theory of everything. Maybe you need some more examples to be convinced? I see your reasoning. Merging distinct phenomena into a single framework can reduce the number of independent constants. Historically, Maxwell's unification is a prime example. However, I'd be cautious. New theories sometimes introduce fresh constants, e.g. Planck's constant. So, while reducing unexplained numbers is a strong indicator of unification, it's not the sole criterion for progress. It may not be the sole criterion, yet the most objective one for measuring progress. Since you mentioned H Planck's constant, let me give you two more examples from atomic physics where revolutions were accompanied by simplification. Johann Jakob Balmer in 1885 considered spectral lines. I would call these constants of nature since we deal with unexplained messages of nature. Balmer then discovered the famous formula that explained this variety of spectral lines with just one number called Rydberg's constant, a tremendous simplification. And some 30 years later, Niels Bohr expressed Rydberg's constant by other constants of nature. Again, one constant less. I would claim that this is the epistemological progress of quantum mechanics. In contrast, 
The mere discovery of it was rather the appearance of an anomaly indicating a crisis before the revolution. Yes, that's a solid perspective. New constants often start as anomalies like H, but can ultimately unify multiple phenomena and reduce the total independent parameters, as with the Rydberg constant. This pattern, fewer unexplained numbers, does look like a strong indicator of deeper understanding. Glad you agree. Besides Palmer and Bohr, maybe Newton's law of gravitation was the most efficient simplification. It explains all the local gravity accelerations, such as 9.81 on Earth, from only one constant big G. And not because we want to invoke authority, but it is reassuring that Einstein wanted to get rid of arbitrary numbers. He said, I cannot imagine a reasonably unified theory containing an explicit number, which the whim of the creator could just as easily have chosen differently. However, you might have objections and name revolutions where this pattern of simplification does not occur. One major example is the standard model. While it unified electromagnetic and weak interactions into the electroweak theory, it introduced multiple parameters, hmm. coupling constants, masses, mixing angles. Indeed. In fact, we now have a zoo of constants. There. <laughs> so not every major advance has clearly reduced the count of fundamental numbers, though it might still be possible that some deeper theory will unify them further and remove free parameters in the future. Well, thanks for the example, but I would turn the argument around. It is precisely because the standard model has produced a mess of free parameters, I wouldn't consider it progress. It rather seems a dead end as the Ptolemaic epicycles, and for the very same reason. From a mainstream perspective, the standard model is undeniably successful experimentally and conceptually unifies the electromagnetic and weak interactions. However, its multitude of parameters suggests it may be more akin to a patchwork effective theory, highly predictive yet not the final fundamental framework. So while it's definitely progress in some sense, it may still need a deeper unification to reduce its many free parameters aligning with the simplification principle you advocate. Yeah, I should have challenged now the four interactions, but my answer was just, okay, we can argue here back and forth, but undeniably, no one has yet built something useful based on a W boson or a muon neutrino, in contrast to the examples given above. If we take applicability as a measure of progress, the standard model fails too. Shouldn't it be a useful working hypothesis that real progress is related to simplification in the sense of reducing free parameters, or if you want constants of nature? It's a coherent working hypothesis, yes. Reduction of parameters often coincides with deeper unification and broader applicability. That said, discovery-driven models sometimes add constants initially, like H, before subsequent unification eliminates them. So while simplification is a powerful guiding principle, it might emerge in stages rather than all at once. By the way, if you want to have the opportunity to discuss fundamental physics with me and others, consider attending the Demysticon 2025 conference organized by Anastasia and Shilo, a couple with a wonderful channel, Demystify Science, and it's a marvelous place in Portugal. See the link in the description. I grant you that discoveries such as H may incentivize progress but are not yet. Thomas Kuhn in his landmark book The Structure of Scientific Revolutions introduced the concept of normal science, a period in which unexpected results called anomalies accumulate. These anomalies are integrated in the existing paradigm, that is, the accepted theories, which become more and more complicated, however. Scientific revolutions instead introduce radical simplifications called paradigm shifts. Such revolutions are often explanations of constants of nature. Thus, we call a newly discovered constant maybe better an anomaly. Why the discovery can be considered experimental progress, getting rid of these anomalies is the essence of theoretical understanding. That aligns well with Kuhn's view. During normal science, anomalies accumulate and theories become cumbersome. Then a paradigm shift unifies those anomalies, often reducing the number of independent constants. Thus, newly introduced constants are anomalies awaiting explanation and real theoretical progress comes from eliminating them. Okay, you seem to consider Kuhn's views reasonable. As a consequence, how far do you think we are currently from a theory of everything that, taking that extreme view, must eliminate all arbitrary constants? 
Do you have an estimate of the number of unexplained constants in today's standard models? In the standard model alone, we have roughly 19 to 25 <laughs> parameters, depending on how you count neutrino masses and mixing angles. Including gravity adds more constants. Mm, considerably. So, if a theory of everything must eliminate all arbitrary numbers, we're quite far. <laughs> Despite unifications like electroweak theory, there's still a sizable zoo of fundamental constants left unexplained. Yes, cosmology adds a dozen or so. But if you agree that it is the job of a theoretical physicist to explain constants of nature, you may not be immediately happy with my third statement. As a matter of principle, most constants of nature can be eliminated. You may raise a couple of objections here, such as what is a constant of nature, but Einstein made a strong case when he said, numbers arbitrarily chosen by God do not exist. Their alleged existence relies on our incomplete understanding. Yes, there's a tension here. On the one hand, many physicists aspire to a framework where the constants emerge from deeper, possibly geometric or logical principles. On the other, there's no guarantee that all constants can be derived. Some argue there may remain irreducible dimensionless numbers that simply define our universe. So while Einstein's quote embodies an ideal of complete explanation, it remains uncertain whether all constants truly can be eliminated in practice. No question, we haven't figured out them yet, but believing that there are numbers that cannot be explained is like invoking gods of modernity, a deeply unscientific attitude. By the way, it is useful we distinguish here dimensionless and dimensionful constants. The former can evidently be calculated as a matter of principle, I'm not saying anyone has done it yet, but you can certainly not exclude that. For explaining the latter, dimensionful constants, the very physical units can be helpful in finding coincidences. Yes, dimensionless constants, like the fine structure constant, are prime candidates for deeper theoretical derivation. In principle, one could imagine a theory that outputs 137, or whatever, from purely mathematical constructs. Dimensionful constants, meanwhile, often reflect our choice of units, so one can sometimes trade them for equivalent dimensionless ratios. So while we haven't found such explanations yet, it's not inherently unscientific to believe they might exist. Yeah, I should have addressed here more this argument with dimensionful constants, but I was triggered a little bit by it's not inherently unscientific, so I blasted. Come on, it's the only way of being scientific to strive for explanations. Believing in God-given numbers is religion. Yes, striving for deeper explanations is central to science. Accepting unexplained constants as final truths is more of a placeholder than a resolution. Hmm. It's not guaranteed that every constant can be derived, but aiming to reduce them, rather than elevating them to givens, is the scientific mindset. Just a nice quote by Richard Feynman that underscores the point regarding the fine structure constant you mentioned above. He said, it's one of the greatest damn mysteries of physics. All good theoretical physicists put this number up on their wall and worry about it. So you would at least admit it is a coherent, reasonable strategy for a theory of everything or attempting these theories to calculate such numbers. And if you take the everything seriously, all these numbers, right? Yes, it's coherent. A TOEI that calculates the values of all physical constants, especially dimensionless ones, would fulfill the deepest unification goals. It's an ambitious but logically consistent approach. But how do we get a hunch? I should add that historically one can usually identify three steps of a scientific revolution. One, an intriguing numerical coincidence, see polymers or electromagnetic waves. Second, a mathematical formalism that justifies that coincidence. And third, the eventual elimination of a constant leading to simplification. So it might be a good idea to look out for such coincidences. Indeed, spotting numerical coincidences can guide revolutions. Balmer's formula is a perfect example. The numerical pattern led to a unifying insight and elimination of an extra constant. While one must be wary of unfounded numerology, Historically, such coincidences have been strong clues driving paradigm shifts. Yes, I'd like to press you a little bit on the constants that are not dimensionless. While it's clear that some genius might have an idea how to calculate 137 or 1386, some deny that for constants such as big G. Any idea? Put a little trap here. Yes. For dimensionful constants like G, 
we can form dimensionless combinations, e.g. GMP square wage bar C. A deeper theory might predict those ratios precisely. So while G itself reflects our choice of units, the key is explaining the resulting dimensionless quantity in a unified framework. Yeah, I think it's quite remarkable that he brought this up here. And my answer was, yes, this is related to Dirac's large numbers, because it's 1 over 10 to the 40, the number calculated here. Dirac's large numbers, a deep riddle we shall come back to. I'm a little disappointed, however, that you did not comment on my intentional, sorry, flip of numbers in the proton-electron mass ratio above. Mind that I am grateful for being corrected and having my views challenged. Apologies for missing that flip. The actual proton-to-electron mass ratio is around okay. 1836, not 1386. Not sure he Indeed, really missed carefully it. carefully checking numerical values is vital, especially when discussing possible coincidences that might hint at deeper connections or theoretical explanations. I'd like to postpone the more concrete discussion of how to possibly calculate constants to a later session. However, another thing I wondered why you did not bring up relativity as an example of a revolution that seemingly occurred without such a simplification. Relativity did unify concepts in a crucial way. Special relativity merged space and time into space-time and made C a universal limit rather than an arbitrary parameter. So it might not have eliminated numerical constants, but it simplified the conceptual framework, removing the need for an ether, for instance, which still fits the broader pattern of unification. Well, this is a reasonable statement, even if there is more to say about the ether. I would agree that special relativity has achieved some relative simplification by invoking very few parameters for a variety of phenomena, yet I would argue that there is still an anomaly that has not been explained by it. Can you guess what I mean? A good candidate is the value of C itself. Special relativity postulates its invariance, but doesn't explain why light speed and vacuum should have that specific numerical value. It becomes a fundamental constant, still awaiting a deeper rationale, an anomaly that SR leaves as a given. Very close, congrats. While the numerical value is just a matter of definition, the very fact that such a limiting velocity exists is an anomaly of Newtonian physics that is not yet resolved. Exactly. Special relativity assumes a universal invariant speed, ultimately tied to light and vacuum, but it doesn't derive why nature must have such a limiting velocity in the first place. That's left as a postulate rather than an outcome of a deeper principle, hence still an unresolved anomaly. Yeah, I think it's really remarkable that he brought up C in this context because usually not many physicists understand that C is in indeed yet an unresolved anomaly. I think he very well understood what I was saying, so maybe he's a little bit agreeable, but he knows exactly what he's talking about. And I'm certainly curious to continue the conversation. By the way, if you want to dive deeper into the subject, this is my book, The Mathematical Reality. And what we discussed here was more or less the first part, the general methodology of science and the fact that considering constants of nature is the royal road to any theory of everything, whatever this theory might look like. So if you're interested in the fundamentals of physics, or if you have an idea for a theory of everything, here you find the questions to be solved. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like it. And if you're interested in fundamental physics of this kind, subscribe to this channel.